Greetings book lovers everywhere. I'm E-Train and welcome to E-Train Talks, where I discuss everything books in the hopes of inspiring others to love reading as much as I do. Today's another exciting day on E-Train Talks because I have the pleasure and honor of speaking with a literacy advocacy champion and an end book desert hero, Dr. Molly Ness. Molly has been working hard, carving out an incredible literacy path and promoting literacy equity. She's founded two literacy organizations, but that's just a blip of all that she's done to promote literacy. She's a former teacher, author, reading researcher, educator, the founder of End Book Deserts, a podcast and blog devoted to getting books into the hands of kids who need them, and a co-founder of the Coalition for Literacy Equity, a group of authors, literacy advocates like me, and more whose goal is to ensure that no books or kids are left behind. And that's just a glimpse of all that she does. She really is amazing. And you might not know this, but I've had the honor of partnering with Molly Ness on her quest to end book deserts. And she's been a huge inspiration over the course of my reading journey. In fact, she interviewed me a few months ago on her end book deserts podcast. And now it's time to turn the tables, or in this case, turn the microphone to her. Welcome to Each Rain Talks, Molly. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see you. It's really nice to see you too. And I'm super excited to get into our interview and learn more about End Book Deserts and everything you do. Me too. Can't wait to tell, share it with you. Yeah, thank you. So I've shared a bit about all of your amazing contributions, but I'm sure, like me, everyone listening is curious to know more about your literacy journey. So would you mind sharing how End Book Deserts, the Coalition for Literacy Equity, and basically your whole journey kind of got into motion? Uh, gladly. So um, I guess it all starts um, more than 20 years ago. I um, left college and taught middle school in Oakland, California. I joined Teach for America, which intentionally takes recent college graduates and puts them in um, districts that are in high need of teachers. So I spent two years teaching in Oakland, California. Um, and I had always been somebody who was interested in social justice and community service and, and equity and found that teaching was the place that let me focus entirely on that. Taught in Oakland, um, taught in Los Angeles for a little bit and recognized that this was gonna be my career but I needed to know a lot more than I did. So I returned to the East Coast where I'm from and spent four years um, getting a doctorate in reading education at the University of Virginia where my main focus was um, reading comprehension research. And then um, took a position as a professor at Fordham University in, in uh, New York City. And I spent 16 years there as a wow. professor, essentially teaching teachers how to help kids develop um, as readers and to love reading. Um, and in addition to doing all of the kind of boring peer reviewed research um, and writing that I had to do to become a tenured professor, I started looking at issues of book access. I sort of stumbled into the research by Susan Newman, who's probably um, my reading research role model, um, and found the research showing just the huge disparity between book access um, in, for kids in low-income areas and um, middle-income and high-income areas, and wanted to shout about this issue from the rooftops. Now at home, I have a daughter who is, I think she's a year older than you at the time. At, and at the time I said, uh, well, I wanna write about this. And my, my daughter who keeps me very humble said, mom, nobody reads anything that you write. You should start a podcast. So um, I started the End Book Deserts podcast. And in it, I want to um, bring awareness to the issue of book access by um, shining the light on the people and programs who work tirelessly in an all sorts of innovative ways to get books into the hands of kids. Um, and there are about 50 different episodes now, everyone from a small grassroots organization to a big organization like Dolly Parton Imagination Library um, to some authors who are, of course, literacy advocates um, that I'm sure um, you would recognize, people like Jason Reynolds and Nick Stone. Um, and all of, in the two years that I've been doing this podcast, people were saying to me, 
I don't feel, I feel like I'm working alone. I feel like I'm operating in a silo. I don't have anybody to, um, to share ideas with. And I got this idea to create a conference, which we had our first conference in 2021, August of 2021, and had 900 people come together to talk about book access, literacy equity, um, issues of um, reading and libraries, and most importantly, how to help kids embrace reading culture. And in August of 2022, we are having our second conference. And that is very exciting. And so it all kind of ties back to teaching, like being a teacher, kind of seeing all of the literacy advocacy, literacy equity stuff firsthand really inspired your work as a writer and as, a, as an advocate. And also huge kudos to your daughter for having the idea to start your podcast, because that's certainly gone a long way. And it's just incredible that you started the whole conference and with and it's just its first conference, the Literacy Equity Conference, everything that it talks about, it, over 900 people came to talk. And now it's even more. August 7th, everybody, link in the description to find out how you can join and learn more at litequity.com. It's just hugely inspiring. I know that so many others are really looking to you for information and just how they can be an advocate. Well, I was super excited this year. The big um, a new addition is a kid panel because we now have a generation of literacy advocates um, who are following in our footsteps. I say following in our footsteps, but really paving their own path. Um, kids like you and a couple other young colleagues. Um, and it was super fun to pre-record that session. Um, so I know that's gonna be a hit because we as the older generation or and as teachers and as librarians and as literacy advocates, we want your ideas on how to make every kid as excited about reading as you are. Um, and so I was so grateful to have some time um, to hear from you and a couple of other amazing um, young literacy advocates. And while that's also going to be a fun panel, there's still so many more to choose from. It's going on all day on August 7th, and that's the best part. So what are the goals of your literacy organizations? So we are trying to connect literacy advocates across the country for the purpose of collaboration, for the purpose of um, moving the needle forward. We know that there's strength in numbers and the more people come together to talk about um, these issues of access and equity, the more we get attention and media coverage and public policy and such. Um, so we are also trying to eventually have some some money to be able to do some sort of scholarship sorts of things. We are um, hoping to kind of be a clearinghouse where schools who don't necessarily have the funding for it can apply for grants from us that we then either um, give books to or more importantly um, and more excitingly kind of have vir virtual author visits to those schools that may not um, be able to do it on their own. And really we just see, um, we're very aware that there's all of these programs and people um, operating in their corners of the country um, and they can learn from each other. And so we are bringing people together to share ideas because what works in Austin may work in Philadelphia. Um, and also to really be mindful of, um, of supporting each other's work and, um, and growing it. We um, are also looking to research that shows that um, sometimes as well intended as all these different programs are, they often sort of replicate or copy each other's work in ways that isn't as efficient as it could be. So we want to help people be really efficient and purposeful and get books where they are intended to go and foster um, the culture of literacy. Well, those are some very, very interesting messages. And I know that you're definitely fulfilling your ambitions because you have received some coverage from national newspapers like the Washington Post, New York Times, and you're really fulfilling your goals. And I know that once End Book Deserts, once the Coalition for Literacy Equity really kind of picks up, like in the coming years, you're going to be able to do a lot more. And I'm so happy to be involved in all that. And yeah, like you said, it, it'll work in like the conferences, all of that. 
it really works everywhere kind of because every place needs a book every kid needs a book and there's so many cities all over where there are title one schools i know that there are quite a few i learned all just in my neighborhood and it's really important to get the word out and that's what you're doing with end book deserts and the coalition well i appreciate it and as many times as i've cited the research around mm -hmm. 32 million American kids not having access to books in their homes, schools, or communities. That still just makes me so angry because it's a yeah. solvable problem. We are talking about items that are easily to, transported and shipped and mailed. We're not talking about things that have a shelf life or that have um, are, are complex to distribute. Um, so to me, this is such a solvable problem. Um, and we have to look to the people who are working in um, such innovative ways and really um, being mindful about their mission and their outreach um, to embrace a, a, a culture where everybody has a book that reflects them and um, the next book that they want to read because it's not just about getting a book or one book it's about this the flow of books in and out of homes and schools and kids hands yeah it takes a village and need a lot more people to add to that village before we can because this is a solvable problem but so many people don't even realize it it takes yep. a village and yep. and, yeah. and of course advocacy begins with awareness once you know something is wrong you need to shine the light on um that that issue and then we can start to address it definitely so i know that we're all eager to help end book deserts and help kids discover the magic of reading so what are some ways people watching can help support your cause well, there are so many different ways. First of all, um, you can listen to any of the podcasts for ideas from these different organizations. If you are somebody who is a roll up your sleeves and get started the work yourself, um, there's just a million different ways you can get involved. You can, of course, donate money um, to any of the organizations on the podcast um, that are um, doing this work. Um, in many different corners of the country. You can also donate time. Um, if money is not um, something that you've got a lot of, you can donate time by volunteering at book banks or at public libraries or all these different organizations or you can um, foster a book drive. I've spoken to kids who have, in lieu of birthday gifts for their eighth birthday or their 12th birthday or what have you, or for their bar mitzvah, they have started book drives um, in their homes and their neighborhoods and their Girl Scout troops and such. And they found um, schools and organizations that um, are accepting gently used books. Um, so you can start a book drive as well. And there's lots of resources at endbookdeserts.com, including some signage and some ideas um, on how to start those book drives. Is that something that is interesting to you? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of things you can do. And we really need people to kind of not wait around for change, but to be the change. And that just be doing something, that really makes a difference. And I know that we both can say we, it, we need a lot of people to contribute. We need we need a lot of help because we can't do this alone. Yeah, and that's what's been super fun about um, the End Book Deserts um, conference and the podcast itself is connecting not just with your kind of traditional literacy advocates, your school librarians and your teachers and your principals and such, but all of these people across different areas and different um, backgrounds that care about literacy and that care about reading. I've interviewed athletes and celebrities and authors. Wow. Um, because reading is something that um, regardless of what your position or your politics or your, your background is, we can all agree on um, reading transforming lives. Um, and so it's been really fun to have some of those non-traditional guests um, talk about the, the work that they're doing as literacy advocates. And that is so much fun and so important. And I'm very proud to be a part of the Coalition for Literacy Equity Conference. And I know that we're all interested in hearing more about the upcoming August 7th event. So would you share the history and mission of the Coalition for Literacy Equity and how we can watch, how we can get involved and participate? Sure. So there is a ton of information on LitEquity.com. And the organization is um, really being mindful about bringing together people from all of these different 
platforms from um, schools and nonprofits and, and publishers and authors um, together to learn and push the needle forward in terms of access to books, in terms of building reading culture. And so this August 7th event is a virtual conference where we'll hear from people who are um, doing this work in their areas and eager to share their ideas and what's been effective um, so that we can all take these ideas and run with them. So we'll be having people who have taken um, public laundromats and changed them into, into um, literacy corners. We are um, having people who have studied the research around book access. We've got some authors We've got um, people who have created nonprofits that sell all kinds of cool swag um, yeah. that all of the all of the money then goes towards literacy programs. So we've got a whole range of of people to talk about all sorts of issues around book access and equity. Um, and of course, um, we've got some surprises up our sleeve. So you'll have to uh, tune in on August 7th um, to watch and um Tickets are available, and even if you can't make the event because you're on vacation or camping in the woods or what have you, tickets will give you access to the videos um, after the event. And that's super exciting. You'll hear from people like me, Orion Jean, who was the Time Kid of the Year. You can also hear from Jennifer Nielsen, Molly Ness. Well, who's she, she's Molly Ness right now <laughs> as well. Um, and just so many literacy advocates who are part of so many organizations like Little Free Library, Freedom USA. Just so much is gonna happen. You need to be there. And I'm just, I'm not just self-promoting, I'm promoting because it's something that's important and myself is included. Um, and there's so much more information like, like Molly said and like I said. And how are you promoting literacy and doing your part to end Book Deserts, Molly? And how can we kind of cheer you on and help you out? Well, so I'm always sharing out ideas on social media. You can follow me at um, Dr. Dr. Molly Ness, that's N-E-S-S, -S, um, because I'm always sharing out the ideas that um, people are um, coming up with to get books out to kids. Um, I spend the summer, I'm lucky enough to spend the summer on the coast of Maine, and um, one of the public schools in my area um, was victim to arson and the entire school, the library, all of the classroom were, were, were totally destroyed. Um, and so a woman that I know that I connected with because of End Book Deserts um, has started a book drive. And so I have um, put flyers up in every um, window of my town and I'm starting a book drive there so that um, when kids go back to school in September of 2022, Hopefully they'll have um, a restocked library and classroom libraries. So most of my work this summer is of course getting ready for this conference, but um, of course I'm doing some sort of just grassroots organization just in my neck of the woods um, to get access to books um, for kids who lost them just because of a, of, a, of, a, of a school fire. And I donated a couple books and I know that so many others have and even though Maine, for a lot of people, it might be thousands of miles away, it's still kids who need the books. Like, I can't imagine a life without reading, like just losing books just because of a fire. And like, I, if I could, I would give this entire bookshelf of books away to the kids. And well, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they're going to be flooded with it. And I can't wait to see not only the teachers and the librarians reactions, but more importantly, the kids reactions. Yeah. I can't wait as well. And I don't know if I'll be able to make it out to Maine, but if they post a picture, I'd know that I'll just smile um, seeing them smile. Well, you've always got an invitation to Maine. We've got some um, fabulous children's book authors and um, such up here and um, lots going on with regard to literacy in Maine as well. Yeah, and if you live in Maine, everybody, that's one, that's one thing you can definitely do. And how can other writers, authors, literacy advocates, organizations, just so many advocates, how can we partner with End Book Deserts, the Coalition for Literacy Equity, and just all your projects? 
Well, um, there are all sorts of ways. So um, the Coalition for Literacy Equity, it runs a year long um, a, a schedule of events for programming. We have, bi, um, we have biannual book clubs where we all choose a book that informs um, the work that we're doing and collectively read it. Um, so you could sign up for that. Every month we do casual kind of think tanks, which are um, about a particular topic. So for example, we had an expert talk to us about reading motivation, ways to motivate kids to read. And we all come together on Zoom on a Wednesday night to chat and share ideas. Um, and I'm always looking for other people to highlight in my blog, in my newsletter, and in my podcast. So um, you can always reach me through um, www.litequity.com to get involved, um, to volunteer yourself or um, the work of a colleague. Um, so we're always eager to shine a light on the um, advocates who are doing such important work. And those are just a couple of ways you can get involved. I know there's so many and it's greatly appreciated, I know. And if and this is a question that I haven't really asked anybody before, so it's kind of original, but I'm also very excited to hear your response. So if you could give your 11 year old self and I'm choosing 11 because that's my age, if you could give them one piece of advice, what piece of advice would it be? My 11 year old self needed perspective. And by that, I mean, when I was 11, I was starting um, a brand new school. I, I started a new middle school in sixth grade. And um, I got overly wrapped up in little things, how well I performed on a test or a party that I didn't get invited to or um, what I looked like. And I wish I spent less time worrying about the stuff that seemed like a big deal at the time, but later on in my life, I realized just doesn't matter so much. So um, perspective is something um, that we all, I think, regardless of our age, um, need to keep in mind, but it really helps me focus on where my energy should go, what I can sort of, in the words of Taylor Swift, shake it off. Um, <laughs> So perspective is something I think we all can, can learn from. And um, in many ways, I think the, the COVID pandemic helped us yeah. as a society have perspective on what mattered and what didn't matter. And um, it's a lesson that I'm continuing to, uh, to hopefully impart to my 12 year old now, um, just the importance of letting go some of the little stuff or, or the, as the title of a book says, don't sweat the small stuff. I know that we all need a little perspective at times, like you said, and just hearing somebody really say it out loud, like kind of being there for you, really giving you the information that you need, that just helps a ton. And I know that so many people are grateful. And that leads me to my final question, the question I ask every single person I interview, literacy advocates, authors, illustrators, everybody, if you could be or meet any literary character, fictional or real, any time period, who would it be and why? Well, so it's funny because I, in my podcast, I always ask people um, to tell me about um, the book that forever shaped them. Mm -hmm. And I like when people cheat and they tell me, well, I was going to say this book, but instead I'm going to say this book. So you're like, wait, 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 you've actually given me three ideas here rather than just your one. So as I was thinking through this question, I was really trying to narrow it down. It is a toss up between Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes. Uh, my daughter's middle name is Eleanor um, after Eleanor Roosevelt um, because Eleanor Roosevelt, I feel in many ways was a woman ahead of her time and was mm -hmm. a social justice pioneer and advocate um, in a time where um, it, it, that wasn't, it, it, that wasn't widely, it wasn't a part of the fabric of society. Um, and she was just such a champion for human rights. Um, and again, just such a, um, 
such a, a leader and a, a, a fierce advocate in so many ways. Um, and I, I have always been fascinated. I would love to, to sit with her. I have visited, um, I like visiting presidential homes. And one of the fun things is when you visit the um, Roosevelt presidential home, um, she actually had her own cottage that hmm. her definition of a cottage and my definition of a cottage or her cottage <laughs> 16 room cottage, um, but she basically felt like she was so independent and had so um, much, a, su such a rich life at a time where women weren't really seen as equals that um, in addition to the home that she shared with her husband, she needed her own retreat. And so I visited her retreat and it's really, it's, it's totally fascinating. And I think she is just um, somebody that we can all look to um, for many lessons about humanity, about social justice, and about advocacy in general. Those are two amazing answers, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Eleanor Roosevelt. They're two of my heroes as well. And I just love the saying, I dissent. And I think that Eleanor Roosevelt and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, they were, like you said, they're ahead of their, they were ahead of their time. They really fought for the basic human rights that a lot of people take for granted now. And before anybody really fought for them as well. Like, and I know that Eleanor Roosevelt, I recently talked to Terry C. Jennings who wrote Polly Murray, The Life of a Pioneering Feminist and Civil Rights Activist. She was friends with Polly Murray and she was a, um, a black civil rights activist. And um, she was friends with Polly Murray. Like, she was friends with, she basically could be friends with anybody because she was so accepting, such an inspiration. And no matter what anybody says, I think that both Eleanor Roosevelt and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you can't not admire them. Um, you can't not admire their tenacity, the amount of criticism and just adversity they overcame to just do the things that they're most known for. And I think that those are two, two of the best answers I've heard. A lot of people have talked about authors, but you're right. Like they're liter they're literacy heroes. They were heroes. Um, and I I would choose Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Eleanor Roosevelt as well. And that is all, everybody. Thanks for listening to my interview with Molly Ness. Molly, I have to say thank you so much for being here. You are an inspiration. And for everybody that hasn't checked out Molly's End Book Deserts podcast and blog, Molly's newsletter, the Coalition for Literacy Equity, go do that. The link is in the description for both, for all three of those websites and her Twitter handle or Instagram handle. It's also in the description. Just check her out because you're going to learn a lot. I know I have. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.